Okay, let's take a look at Mississippi Fortress. This is uh, the Civil War Campaign Series by Clash of Arms. My history with this series <laughs> is a friend of mine introduced me to it once many, many years ago. And we got a chance to play around with, geez, uh, I don't remember exactly which one. Um, I've got Marching Through Georgia there, but I think it was a different one that I actually also have kicking around somewhere. Uh, but things are a little confused. I've got everything. Uh, oh, this one down here. Is this it? No. No. It may have been Marching Through Georgia. Whatever it was, General Rosecrans. Uh, campaign, which I think maybe I don't even have. Um... And I have to say, you know, it intrigued me enough that I bought a number in the series without playing them. <laughs> and that may have been a mistake uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, I'm not a big fan of operational stuff. Secondly, I don't think it's going to play all that well solo because, like, you know, you would expect in an operational Civil War game, a lot of it is about the maneuver and the surprise involved. Uh, in that maneuver. And in particular in the system, it uses hidden uh, movement with uh, dummy counters, and that's going to be somewhat challenging. Uh, of course, I can make decisions with die rolls and stuff, but whatever. Uh, we're going to try to get through as much of the rules as we can here. I don't know if I'm going to explore all three games in the series. <laughs> Uh, but let's start with the uh, the basic rule set for the series, and then I'll go over uh, the intro to this particular game, which is Mississippi Fortress. But let's talk a little bit about the uh, the board, etc. So, well, the components we shall call them. So, one of the first things to look at, yeah, it's area movement. Um, it's got a kind of pretty map, but it may be difficult to distinguish. Uh, some of the information in it. I found that in particular. So, for example, ridge lines here are not terribly easy to see. Uh, other stuff may be equally difficult. It's got that kind of colored pencil look. The actual units in the game, well, all of them are on the board, um, are none too interesting. They have a strength point value, a command uh, Corps Command or whatever, Divisional Command, depending, well, Army Command in this case, and uh, a designation of their own. They break into Infantry, Cavalry, and Artillery, all pretty standard. You also have leaders in the game who are rated with an attack and a defense value, which only matters in combat. Uh, otherwise, the leaders are really just there to trace communications lines, too. This particular one has some gunboats and some steamers as well. We have an example there, which are just counters that the Union has. Although, this one actually comes with a pile of optional units, some of which I have rules for, and some of which I could find the rules for. Um, some of the units, for example, the Confederate naval units, are not included in this rule book. However, I found the second edition rules has the rules for them, so they may have just been dropped. Uh, I don't know if anything major changed in second edition. I would rather have paper rules, and I couldn't find um, I couldn't find a diff uh, and errata that that goes with the game. So, you know, it was like, well, I'm not going to wade through the rule book. Uh, if I have questions, if there's things that don't make sense, I'll look in the second edition rules that I have uh, available online. What else do you have? Well, you got your turn record chart, which has uh, fixed weather on it, but there's also rules for um, non-fixed weather. Oh, this is cool. The victory point schedule is on here. <laughs> It's kind of hard to figure out where it is if you're playing. So I played the introductory scenario, which is really just a chance to throw some troops together and get a fight going. Uh, and I lost terribly as the Union, which might seem impossible to do, but I managed it anyhow by being too bloody. Uh, 
Uh, you've got a battle board. Uh, battle boards usually aren't too exciting to me. This one is relatively... Um, it doesn't have a huge effect on play. Uh, basically, it's just a means of dividing up who shoots at what. In a, in a given battle, and it, it divides up uh, into the different wings so that you can get a little bit of an edge by putting weight on one wing or another. But, um, what else do we have? Well, we have these guys, which are handmade uh, casualty sheets. I have photocopies of the originals as well, but I figure, well, I'll just use the handmade ones one more time before I waste a photocopy because I'm sure I'll be playing this so many times that I won't want to you know, waste my printer ink too many times. I don't know. The point is that I made the handmade ones trying to not bother my wife and then I had her photocopy a couple. Well, I went down and showed her how to photocopy. Um, you have some informational counters for straggler loss, force march counters, ineffectual, uh, fording, because that indicates some special cases. Uh, you have these, which are for the battle board. They determine, you know, what kind of aggressiveness, uh, what, what kind of command you're, you're, you're undergoing on that particular wing. Uh, you have some replacement leaders, and you have uh, a lot of markers to mark where there are combats happening. Uh, a lot more than you need to mark, hey, there's a combat on the board and I'm on the battle board, which is all they're supposed to be used for. But I could see marking them down for, hey, there's a combat required here, which is one facet of the game. A bunch of dummy counters, some victory point markers. Gotta get on the board. And that's about it. The rule book itself is Clash of Arms, which tends to mean it's not written in the most uh, accessible format. Uh, it, it's in a very, very, uh, mm, not very rigid. <laughs> it doesn't go out of its way to make sure that it gets everything down. It doesn't make sure that it's dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, but it also, in doing so, may leave some things out, like the optional units that are included in the game, or stuff like that. Mm. At least it tells you they're optional by putting a star on them. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the sequence of play. Okay, if you're playing with optional weather, at the beginning of each turn, you roll a die, see what the weather is going to be. Um, you could also play with the historical weather. Yeah, weather doesn't look like it has a huge effect on the game. Uh, then each player, it's an I go, you go type setup. Uh, each player gets a, a turn where the first thing they do is they determine whether or not their units are in command and they also do some bookkeeping activities. Uh, then they're able to move their units <laughs> and they don't move very far. Generally it's one area. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then you're going to have a uh, combat phase, which may be mandatory, for example, if you just moved into an area, but it may also uh, be optional. The combat system is actually fairly, uh, fairly complex. Uh, not only the battle board, but it has multiple means of uh, pushing the values into the combat. So one of the things that the rule book doesn't go into, for example, is the fact that the strength points on the counters, which correspond to the number of boxes on a unit, are the actual strength of the unit. So, the, well, the strength points on the counters are, but what's not really noted is that as you take, at least from my reading, as you take losses, your strength reduces. Uh, that's kind of a... Gosh, why doesn't it say that? But I'm assuming that's what they mean. Yeah, <laughs> because otherwise your units never lose strength from stragglers or losses. Um, the actual combat is divided into up to two rounds. The first round is, like I said, usually uh, when you do combat, it's gonna be because it's mandatory. 
you take an attack, uh, well, you must perhaps take an attack. It's a fairly complicated system that uses a combination of a combat intensity, which determines the base number of damage that you take, and then a fire combat results. Um, and depending on how your wings are oriented, you might have more wings in the battle than the enemy does, which actually will allow you to uh, do the fire combat multiple times. The intensity is always applied. What that means is that combat is essentially very bad for the attacker. And that's where I went wrong. I went out hunting the Confederate army when I should have just let them go. <laughs> There's no reason to try to hurt things in this game. Uh, not if you have what you want. Um, and then the player who attacked has a chance to attack again. And they may have to in some special circumstances. Uh, alternatively, just to use a word that people hate, uh, <laughs> you can, the, the defending player can counterattack at this point. Now, they also have a counterattack option as how they're, um, how they're defending. That's something different. Here, they're allowed to accelerate the combat by having a second round, second day of combat, whatever you want to call it. And then what happens is you calculate victory points and make sure they're balanced, whatever, and then the other player goes. Uh, weather is going to be specific to the game rules. Okay, units generally are on the board in an inverted fashion, which allows the dummy units to exist. Sometimes they will be revealed. Uh, they'll be revealed if they're put into a line position in combat rather than the reserve. The reserve could indicate that, geez, there may be a lot of enemy here that I don't know about that could come into the battle. <clears throat> uh, usually you want one formation in the battle at a time, though, so that may not matter much. Uh, they can be revealed through cavalry probes. Um, blocking cavalry probes can reveal them. A interception. And if you have to have units in a place in order to get victory points, you may have to reveal a unit for that. And there are certain special conditions where you might be apparently blocking someone's line of communications, but you're not actually, and then you have to sweep a set of dummy counters off the board to reveal that, no, I'm actually not there, you made it through. Uh, units remain face up until the beginning of your next movement phase, at which point they're re-inverted. The dummies themselves, well, I guess this is the controlling role. They can appear in any area currently occupied by real units of the owning player. Uh, they can be added to stacks or placed in new stacks. More dummies can be placed uh, as long as then there are real units in the area. Um, and I guess you're limited by counter mix and that's about it. No, nope. you're not allowed to have more dummy units in play than you have real units in play of that type as well. Uh, they're revealed if um, the area is the only area through which an opposing player can trace a line of communication. <laughs> but uh, here, here's the problem. Um, there might be two areas that are covered by W units. And that, that again, this is the kind of rules um, specificity that's missing in this game. If there are only units in an area through which the opposing player can uh, is attempting to move real units, uh, the dummies have to be revealed and removed so that the opposing player has the option to move through that area, if that's um, something that he wants to do through force march or whatever. If dummies are the only units in, in which an opposing player declares comma, all the dummies are revealed and removed uh, before the opposing player has to uh, show any of his real units. If there are real units also present, however, uh, those dummy units may retreat before combat, uh, if any of the real units can retreat before combat. <laughs> but you can't screen with dummies. They're not, like, you can't fall back with them if there's no real units there. They will dissolve uh, otherwise. Um, uh, they must be revealed if alone in an area in order to open an avenue for enemy units to retreat before combat or withdraw. Um, this... 
might be the enemy saying, can I retreat before combat? Assuming they would be allowed to otherwise, or, you know, I don't know. I, I think they'd have to play the withdrawal chit, and that would be a very bad thing if there are dummies blocking them. And dummies get to come back whenever you like. If the only units you have in the area are dummies, you can't declare a combat. You can't force the non-phasing player in any way to reveal their units using dummy counters. This may end up uh, in some sort of intransigent situation. I, I don't know who would have to reveal their dummies first in that case. And they can be sent to the reserve position by themselves or with real units during a combat in order to remain concealed. And that can be very useful because your enemy doesn't know how much of a reserve you have available. Not that that probably matters too much. Um, <coughs> your reserve probably isn't that useful in combat from what I can tell. Okay. Um, they have to move as though they're the regular unit they're in. They can't uh, commit illegal moves. Uh, but they could force march. Uh, without taking losses because they don't have any. They can't exert control over an area or influence over adjacent areas. Uh, they cannot do cav stuff, even if they're cav dummies. But they can be stacked with real ones that do this to make them look like your stack's bigger than it actually is. Uh, and again, you can't force someone to reveal their units. We may come to a situation where one player or the other has dummies and somebody has, maybe has to reveal something. I'm not sure how that would happen, but if it does, I'll figure it out at the time. Okay, so the communications phase. Um, normally you have to trace a line of communication to your officer. Now, each command in the game has a specific officer, and in general in the games, there's one commanding um, well, commander, the overall commander, one commanding general. Uh, the officers will have to trace to the commanding general, and then the commanding general has to trace back to his home area. Although in this game, the Union is allowed to wander wherever they like, well, Grant is, because he has decided he doesn't need a command line and there doesn't seem to be any penalty for that. Um, it's just assumed that he's good with wandering around. There's no real supply in the game, so all you have is that. My uh, dinner is about ready, so I'm gonna pause there and we'll go into more depth on the communication. So the communication uh, lines are fairly simple actually, but they take up a lot of time and words to deal with it. Uh, basically an infantry unit has to be able to trace to either the same area or an adjacent area uh, to their personal officer. And if they can't do that, they're not allowed to force march and they're not allowed certain combat orders, advance, assault, and counterattack, basically the more violent orders. But they can move in, attack an area, and probe, or whatever the term for that is. Uh, so they're not prevented from any offensive action whatsoever. Okay, from the officer, then you have to trace back to the commander, and there's generally one per game. This game, one per game per, per side. This game, the Confederates actually have two, uh, because there's two Confederate armies in play here. Uh, <clears throat> so the officer has to trace back to the commander, and that's either the same or an adjacent region again. Um, terrain and, and enemy units don't have an effect uh, in general. Yeah. The one exception in both these cases is if, if the officer is alone with enemy units, which is just something you should probably try to avoid. Um, and the officer is also allowed to trace a continuous path along roads or railroads uh, back to his commander. Now, this can go across major rivers at crossing points. Uh, boo, 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 boo. It cannot go through solely enemy controlled areas though. Um, and the difference there being, if you're tracing from one of your areas to another of your areas that's adjacent, they're considered to be 
contiguous, the lines can connect in some way, or the forces are close enough that they can communicate. But if you're tracing through an enemy space, you know, like here, uh, there's patrols, etc., you're not going to get commands through well, at least in concept. Um, you can go through areas uh, that have friendly and enemy units. But your militia, infantry, leaders, and dummies will not negate the presence of real enemy units. However, and this is where you might have to reveal... God, I don't know. This is where another place where revelation comes into weirdness. A militia unit on its own in an area will still block the path. So, I mean, to some extent, you have to be able to trust your opponent to say, yeah, those are real units, those aren't. The game's a little fuzzy and I am too, uh, about these things. Uh, officers who can't trace to the commander, their subordinate infantry units cannot block the enemy from tracing a line of command through an area the units occupy. Uh, I'm again seeing potential conflicts here. I'm not really going to try to pin them down and say they can happen. I think you're going to end up First of all, in this game, it's very unlikely because the Union's kind of untethered, but uh, I think you're going to end up not running into these cases, but it feels like there's likely pathological situations. Uh, subordinate infantry units may not assault or counterattack, but they can attack, advance, which they couldn't do if they, weren't, if they didn't have uh, an officer with them. Then there's one final command... Uh, tracing, which is the commander back to his home area. And if you're in or adjacent to the home area, you can trace automatically. Otherwise, you can trace long roads or railroads from the area you occupy back to the home area. Uh, you can't go through sole control, same rules as above. Uh, this does not make the commander unable it doesn't make the commander's troops unable to act the one thing it generally might do is it might affect whether or not you can give victory points i don't think in mississippi fortress there are any such rules but again the rules are kind of in a disorganized way so it's hard to tell uh, without reading every word carefully looking for something in particular um, certain units, artillery, cav, and garrisons, or militia, infantry, do not have to trace a line of communication, and they're not affected by leaders that fail to do so. Um, however, they have to follow the line of communication restrictions of any infantry units that are placed in their line in the battlefield. Okay. And there's a lot of rules to cover what is really kind of simple and I think could have been explained a little quicker. And that, that's kind of one of the problems with this game. The, the rules are very wordy, but not, uh, not precise. <laughs> Those two things kind of go together. Um, so you end up reading a lot of words and not being sure what's intended. There's not really been an attempt for parsimony on them. Okay, during movement, um, units basically can move in four ways. Uh, in the movement phase, they can march, they can move, and they can force march. During combat, they're allowed to re retreat before combat and uh, withdraw based on the order that they pick for their, fi for their field uh, command. Okay, let's use makeup terms and stuff here. <laughs> they sound right. Uh, okay, for regular movement, Cavalry and leaders are allowed to move two spaces normally. Everything else, one space. There might be exceptions in the ex uh, exclusive rules. Uh, you have to go contiguous. Okay, non-cav units have to stop if they enter an enemy-controlled area, even if they're forced marching. Um, Cavalry units can pass through the first enemy-controlled area they enter. However, and a second one if they're forced marching. However, they can be intercepted by enemy cav. Um, unless they cross over a major river, in which case you're assumed to be interdicted by whatever's there. Um, 
you might be able to exit the map. And if you do, you would generally be out of play for the remainder of the game, but not counting as losses. Okay, if you want to force march, that's to try to get one additional movement area. Uh, but when you do so, you might straggle. All cav, artillery, and garrison are eligible uh, to march an extra movement, allow movement point through force march. Regular is allowed to do it if it has a line of communication uh, to their officer. Militia, who I think were not covered here, no, garrisons were covered here, um, are never allowed to force march. And when you do so, you get a little force march counter over here. Hey, look, the counter art is not very distinguished. Um, in order to do it, you have to have a road or railroad connecting the two areas. You cannot, you cannot force march without a railroad, without a, a, a pathway, a road or a railroad. Um, you may not force march into or out of rough swamp or mountainous areas, nor across ridges. Now, I don't know if this game has rough. It has this stuff, which is better defense. <laughs> but I don't think it's defined. It's called defensible terrain. It's not called rough, and I think it's just woods, so I assume you're able to force march fine with that. Um... Units may not force march the turn they cross a major river over a crossing point, even if the crossing point is a bridge. Uh, militia units and ineffective units cannot force march. If you force march in combat, you'll be halved in strength if you're not artillery. The artillery won't be allowed to attack at all and must stay in the reserve portion throughout the entire combat. Uh, However, if they're attacked, they defend at full strength. That would happen in the opposing player's turn, so it really doesn't matter. And then at the end of a movement phase, if you force marched, you're going to have to roll on a table to see if you straggle. And that's actually a pretty simple table. You roll a die, modifier for weather, and uh, if you have straggled on the immediately previous turn. There are no instructions for exactly how to keep track of that. There's hints about it, but they don't quite uh, apply to straggling. <laughs> they apply to other losses, and they actually don't work. So, whatever. Um, reinforcements, reinforcement units come in. Uh, it says they may enter the map. It does count as the first area moved when you when you come onto the map. And we have a bunch of reinforcements slated there. They're all in the, uh, in the specific roles. Stacking. Okay, stacking affects weird things. In general, an area can hold as many units as you like. However, there are stacks that must be five units at the end of the movement phase. And then you can't reshuffle them until the end of your next movement phase but you can move them without being in their stack, so. <laughs> uh, leaders and dummies do count towards that five stack limit. Any markers don't. The reason for this is you would disturb the, uh, <coughs> the hidden capabilities if you allow dummies and leaders to count. Okay. Now, during combat, you're allowed to reorganize your stack as you see fit. You don't have to maintain those stacks in terms of wings or anything like that. So your commands can be assigned to the battlefield however you like. Uh, in line positions, they have their own special stacking, which is up to all the infantry units from any one formation, plus two non-infantry units, cav or artillery, but not militia or garrison infantry, or any two infantry units from different formations plus any combination of two militia or garrison units, cavalry, or artillery. Okay. Um, dummy units and officers can be added to the line. Uh, they don't count against the position stacking limits. However, if they're dummies, you're going to reveal where they are when you uh, execute the combat there, and they're going to go away. They're only there to trick the enemy. And in fact, the defender has to place first, so there might be a good reason to do that. Okay, controlling territory. Infantry, cavalry, and artillery can control an area that they occupy. 
Uh, this will block enemy lines of communications going through it and hinder movement through the area. Areas that are adjacent to a controlled area are considered influence. This can affect your movement, retreats, and withdrawals. Control and influence are not exclusive. Both players can have mutual effects on a, the same area. Okay. All infantry and artillery must stop when they enter an enemy-controlled area. Cavalry do not have to, unless they get intercepted, which is a special case. Um, both players are mutually affected by each other's control. The following conditions involve exiting. In order to exit, for infantry and artillery to exit an enemy-controlled area, they have to eliminate the enemy. Well, then it's not controlled anymore. They can retreat before combat. They can execute the withdraw combat order. Now, I don't think that infantry and artillery can retreat before combat, so <laughs> that may be a lie. But I may just be mistaken. Okay. Very specifically, infantry cannot, but militia infantry can. Uh, okay. Um, execute the withdrawal uh, combat order, or after initiating combat against the enemy, exerting control over the area under certain special conditions, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, CAV can always exit an enemy-controlled area without satisfying those uh, requirements, but they may be intercepted by it. And then if you're probing across major rivers, you have restrictions on how you can exit, which is under the CAV rules. Leaders, in a, and this is how the rules are, you know, all these exceptions and, and still not able to do it uh, Briefly, leaders in an enemy-controlled area may freely exit if on their uh, 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 may exit it on their following turn without needing to meet any of the requirements above. Leaders, okay. Nothing about troops. Right, exiting after combat. If you attempt to engage in combat with the enemy who is exerting control over an area, you may leave the area in your following movement phase only, regardless of the outcome of the combat. This is true even if uh, you leave during the combat phase and re-enter the area during your movement phase in your half of the turn. Uh, and I don't even want to think about what that means because it sounds like you can dance. That's what these initiated combat markers are for. There's not a lot of them. Uh, probably not enough, but I'm not sure. Okay. Artillery in control of areas. Artillery on their own in an area don't exert influence over adjacent areas because, you know, they can shoot far. Uh, artillery units, <laughs> don't worry, uh, alone or stacked with friendly units in an area exert control over that area. Uh, if it's a mountainous or rough terrain area, it'll be guarding the passes. Or if it has crossing points over a major river, joining it to another area, and the enemy units are entering the area by crossing the crossing points. In this case, the artillery does exert control in the area. Um, and that'll be a case like this, where there's a crossing arrow here. Uh, that artillery will provide the same effect as control of the area. But if I come walking through, this is a battery, so it may have special rules. But if I come walking up here, I can just keep walking through. It's not in control. Okay. Units that enter an area that's controlled by an enemy artillery unit must initiate combat, whether or not the en there are other enemy units in the area as well. So artillery forces combat when you enter an area. Again, all the units are hidden, so your enemy has to kind of tell you that, I guess. Seems reasonable. Uh, leaders alone don't exert control nor influence. Major rivers. Major rivers are significant uh, crossing obstacles. You can cross major rivers only at crossing points. Crossing points are generally bridges, ferries, and fords. Now, let's see. I think this is the only major river, but I may be mistaken. This may count as a major river. So here's like a ford, you know, and... We have, 
the Mississippi and the Yazoo are exceedingly major rivers. So the, this, the Pearl, is considered a major river. The Mississippi and the Yazoo are considered so large that they actually can't be forded. They only have, or bridged for that matter, at this era, they only have um, river crossings, which require boats. Okay. Um, units exert influence over adjacent areas separated by major rivers only if there's a crossing point between them. Infantry and artillery that cross a major river into an area controlled by enemy units must stop and initiate combat during the combat phase. Cavalry units are subject to this rule as well, unless they're probing, in which case they may exit back to the area they came from after completing the probe. Now, you tell me how you crossed that bridge and didn't get noticed so that you had to attack, and we'll, we'll think about that, but okay. Uh, units that cross major uh, rivers and engage in combat may only use half their combat strength points. When defending, the units which cross the major river are unaffected, i.e. it only matters as you're crossing the river oh, for, the, for the defender. You know, as you cross the river, if you're being interdicted by a cordon, basically, you can get hit. Uh, the attacker's units that cross major rivers into areas solely controlled by the defender must be returned to the areas they crossed from if they don't drive off all of the defender's units. Um, the defender has to either retreat before combat, withdraw from the area, or be completely eliminated. Or rendered ineffective, which is essentially routed from the field, so they're no longer going to be able to defend the crossing point. If the attacker fails to drive off the defender by the end of the first combat round, he must return back across the river um, as if he had played a withdrawal combat order, regardless of what orders he played, or declare a second round of attack. If he doesn't succeed in the second round, he does have to fall back no matter what. But there's an exception. If he had an officer in the area and the defender does not, or if his officer is better than the defender's officer, he's able to get a bridgehead across the way. Rules by exception. If the, attack, if the attacker returns to his side of the river after the first round, the defender is not allowed to initiate a second round of combat. Normally when you enter an area, if you start a combat, that second round is always available to the defender, but falling back behind a river line Mm -mm. However easy it is to retreat back across the river, across a ford, or worse, a bridge, I don't know. Um, if both players mutually control an area that, at the start of the movement phase, then friendly units attempting to enter the area from across a major river may do so without having to declare combat, and they can remain in the area. Basically, it's assumed that the bridge is at least temporarily controlled by the other units that are allied to them. <sighs> Of course, you can't have a rule here without an exception. Uh, units attempting to cross a major river into a mutually controlled area that contains enemy artillery must still initiate combat regardless of the presence of the other enemy and or friendly units. Uh, such units, however, do not return across the river. And that kind of follows from what we're seeing. Whew. All right. Uh, let me take a little break. Special cav rolls. Cavalry probes. Um... They're conducted in the movement phase by cav units of the phasing player. If successful, they allow you to look at some of the inverted units in a given area. When you enter an enemy-occupied area, you may try to inspect the enemy stacks in the area. You announce a probe, at which point you reveal the cav units that will be used in the probe. These remain revealed until your next friendly movement phase. In order to combine cav strength points, uh, in a probe, the units have to enter the area being probed as one stack. If they're in different areas or in different stacks, they must first move to a new area, combine, and then move to the area to be probed. And that sounds like you can do it as kind of part of a fluid action in the move, um, <laughs> which may involve multiple stacks moving disjointed. Not sure. Two or more cav units may attempt to separate, uh, attempt separate probes against the same enemy stack, whether they entered the area stacked together or not. Uh, a stack doesn't have to do one probe. You can break it into individual cav units to do probes. If the non-phasing player has any cav in the area being probed, he can choose to block the probe. Uh, 
He reveals the CAV units that he will commit to blocking the probe. These can come from any stacks in the area and any position in the stack. It's not mandatory that an attempt be made to block the probe. You can ignore it and hope the probe fails. You total the strength points of the units of the probe and subtract the strength points of the units blocking that probe. If it's a zero or less, it's blocked. If it's greater than zero, you roll on the probe table, which is here, and you look at a differential, you roll, and that's how many units in that stack you get to see. And that's all you get to do, you just get to see them. Uh, you select the stack you wish to inspect, and the opposing player has to reveal units from the top of the stack, uh, but he doesn't count leaders. In fact, he just skips them and says, this is a leader, you don't know who. You probably have a pretty good guess, but there might be confusions. Enemy cav units from the stack that were revealed to block the probe do not count either. Dummy units do count, and they'll be removed. Enemy units revealed through probes remain face up until their next friendly movement phase when they can be reinverted. Uh, whether something's face up or face down, that's really only the obvious. Can you see what the enemy's got there? After the probe, the cav unit can then continue moving the rest of its movement allowance. It's possible to conduct a series of probes in an area if you have enough cav units. Uh, each probe follows the same procedure, but no cav unit can go can do more than one probe per turn. You can't block more than one probe per turn um, with each cav unit. However, if you discover an enemy cav unit flipping it over face up, it can try to block afterwards, which is going to be hard to record. A cav unit can only do one probe per turn. We talked about that. It can enter an area probe and then enter another area, but it can't probe in both areas. Uh, a probe can't take place if the probing unit's strength is reduced to zero or less. Um, if it's forced marching and wishes to probe, it can only do so in the first or second area entered. It can't do it during the forced march. If it probes across a major river, there must be a crossing point. The CAV unit's probe uh, must, after continuing the probe, return to the area they cross the river from or remain in the enemy-occupied area and declare combat. CAV sucks at combat, so you don't want to do that, <laughs> usually. CAV versus CAV is okay. Uh, the CAV units may not continue moving except to return to the area they came from, and in this case there's no combat. If there's an enemy artillery unit, they have to stick around and die. Uh, you're free to move other units in, though, after you probe. Similar to Gettysburg, <laughs> where uh, Buford's troops show up and they're like, yeah, get us some reinforcements. Interception. Cav can intercept to prevent enemy cavalry units from doing certain actions, uh, such as and exiting a controlled area or retreat before combat. Interception is voluntary. During the phasing player's movement phase, some or all of the non-phasing player's CAV units in an area may intercept any enemy CAV units that enter the area, which then attempt to exit. Um, during the phasing player's movement phase, some or all of the non-phasing player CAV units in the area can intercept any enemy CAV units that begin the movement phase in the area and then attempt to exit without having met the requirements uh, for battle, etc., that allow infantry and artillery to leave. Hmm. Uh, during the phasing, and no, there's no cav mentioned in that part of that role. During the phasing player's combat phase, the phasing player may use any or all of his cav units in an area to intercept any enemy cav units. Uh, that attempt to retreat before combat from the area. If the area is mutually controlled by players, the same conditions apply. Uh, to intercept, you declare you're intercepting and you reveal cav units used to intercept. This will affect all enemy cav units that are attempting to move or retreat before combat. A given cav unit may declare it is intercepting as many times as opportunities arrive, 
there is no limit to the number of times a given calf can intercept. <coughs> the same calf unit can intercept more than one enemy calf unit. If it intercepts more than one attempted enemy action, um, then all interceptions will be resolved as a single interception combat. If all the enemy units being intercepted turn out to be dummy units, they're revealed and removed, and the intercepting units are immediately reinverted. However, if some of the intercepted units are not dummies, then the dummies go away. Uh, no, then the dummies are not revealed, and you proceed to the interception combat eventually. But you've got some surprise in your hand. You've just intercepted some calf. You don't know what it is. All enemy calf units that are intercepted must engage in a special combat during the combat phase. Um, if you intercept under the first two cases, which is during normal movement, basically, the non-phasing player is the attacker. Under case three, the phasing player is the attacker, uh, which is he's trying to prevent the retreat before combat that he's just declared. Uh, it's possible that both players could be eligible to be the attacker, in which case you roll a die. Uh, hey, they specify it there. I think that there are other cases where the rules have ambiguities that are not covered as well. During the combat phase, it's possible to have a maximum of two combats in the area. An interception combat, cav versus cav, and a regular combat, everything else, which could include some cav. Uh, the interception combat is separate from any regular combat, and it takes priority, whatever that means. I think it just means it gets done first. Let me give an example. Combat and interception actions is exactly the same as regular combat, except that only cav are involved, uh, and officers cannot have an effect. Cavalry units that conduct interception have some, intercep have some restrictions. Uh, if they attempt interception, they must be present in the area where the enemy activity to be prevented is occurring, and they cannot currently be ineffective. And the non-phasing player's calf units that were re revealed to block an enemy calf patrol may not also be used to intercept the phasing player's cavalry units. Hmm. Funny that hadn't been mentioned, but okay. Okay, how does combat work? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to set up the battle board. Um, then the attacker, well, you set up the battle board, you pick orders for your units, and then the attacker gets to pick specific lineups that he wants to fight. There's some special rules if things don't align three wings to three wings. After that, you follow a certain procedure, which is first you calculate the combat intensity. You look at the ratio compared to the combat intensity, and that'll cause losses. The majority of those losses happen to the attacker for the most part, unless the odds are really in favor of the attacker. And then you go to potential fire combat. Um, basically, each wing is allowed to shoot once. So if you've got straight lineups, Basically, each wing will fire at its opposing wing. If you've got a situation where it's two wings against one, uh, the single wing has to choose one enemy to shoot at, and the two attack and the two other wings that outnumber it both get to fire. And they'll be going on this, looking at their strength, comparing it to the position, and rolling a die. And again, the losses aren't very high for this. In fact, losses are pretty low for a battle overall. Uh, okay. Um, then, after the first round of combat, the attacker has the option to perform a second round of combat. If he chooses not to, the defender has the option to pursue that second round of combat. Um, if you're not talking about a major river crossing, nothing special happens. You've gained the ground and you're allowed to stay in the area. If there's a major river crossing, the attacker has to drive the defender off um, in the first round or withdraw, or in the second round or withdraw, <laughs> you know. Uh, okay. 
you can avoid combat. There's a couple of ways to do this. At the be before combat roll rolls are made, there's retreat before combat. This is only for the non-phasing player. If he's attacked, he can try to retreat before combat. Only leaders, militia, infantry, artillery, and cavalry units, or a combination, can retreat before combat. If any other unit types, well, that is largely garrisons or regular infantry, are present, you cannot retreat. And that's specified. In fact, no units can retreat. Calf units that retreat before combat can be intercepted. <laughs> Otherwise, units that retreat before combat cannot be uh, interfered with. Dummy cavalry units can retreat before combat if alone or with real cavalry units, if otherwise eligible. They can be intercepted, and if they're moving alone, they can be eliminated just automatically by that. Um, dummy infantry cannot retreat before combat and must be revealed and removed to allow other uh, eligible units to retreat before combat. Okay, during combat, you might pick the withdraw option. And that actually has a combat, in, you know, ends up being fought out as a full combat. But after the combat is completed, then the units are allowed to leave um, the area. If you order issue a withdraw combat order to a line position, the withdraw is executed at the end of the combat round. It's issued. Any type of unit can withdraw. You can pull a reserve with you no matter which line is withdrawing, which wing. Um, if a unit retreats before combat or executes a withdrawal, it moves to an adjacent area. And first to an area that's solely under friendly control or an unoccupied area influenced only by friendly units. Second, to an unoccupied area not solely influenced by either player which either contains or is closest to a non-involved friendly leader. Third, towards an area designated in the exclusive rules as that side's home area. Or fourth, to an area currently occupied by both players. Um, units which go into a mutually occupied area cannot take part in any combat rounds for that, round, for that turn. Um, they cannot take losses or be involved in combat, but they may retreat before combat or withdraw again along with eligible friendly units. And they will not have to roll for additional stra No, they do have to, no, but need not. They do not have to roll for additional stragglers. Uh, if no adjacent area meets the criteria, they're not allowed to retreat. All right, battle board positions. So you're allowed to fill pretty much as many of these positions as you like. There's a restriction on the attacker, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, you must be in at least one line position, and you can be at most in three. If the defender only has one line position, the attacker can only have two, uh, maximum. <laughs> Stacking within the line position follows the restrictions that we talked about before, which usually is an entire infantry formation and a couple auxiliary cav artillery uh, units uh, to fill that out. Things get more mixed up if you don't have a full infantry formation to put in place. It's two infantry units plus up to two other types of units. Um, if the attacker only takes one line position, he must deploy in the center. If he takes two, he gets to choose, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a line position must contain at least one unit capable of fighting. You can't just put dummies into a line position or an officer. Uh, but as long as there's real units in there, you can put as many dummies or officers as you like to try to fool the attacker primarily. The attacker's line positions may not contain any ineffective units at all. The defender's line positions can have ineffective units. However, if it only has ineffective units, the only combat order you can uh, put on the position is a withdraw. Uh, otherwise, you, if you have any ineffective, you can issue the stand order or the withdraw order. Um, 
If the attacker has fewer line positions than the defender, the attacker will have to attack two or more defenders' line positions with one of his own. He also gets a penalty to the column shift on firing. If he has more line positions than the defender, it allows two of the attacker's line positions to attack only one of the defender's positions, but there's no bonus shift uh, for that kind of flanking maneuver. Um, it's possible for the defender to have three line positions and the attacker to only have one. That's, that's a bad situation for the attacker, probably. I mean, unless the defender did something stupid and spread their forces all over the place for no good reason. Um, although it does reduce the attacker's firepower, so it might make some sense. Um, but concentrating seems more valuable. Uh, the reserve uh, is not going to be involved in the battle, but... Between rounds, you can add units from the reserve to the line and to handle that. Okay. You also have to select an order for each line position. And the attacking orders are diversion, yeah, that was my probe, advance and assault. The defender has withdraw, stand, and counterattack. In particular, there are some limitations here. So communications affects what the attacker can do. Uh, the defender, yeah. The withdrawal allows him to get out of there, but also effectiveness prevents him from counterattack. Um, you put one order on each uh, line position. Okay. Uh, the withdraw at the end of the turn, at the end of the round of combat, the units that are given a withdraw order will be withdrawing from the combat, and they'll be straggling. And they use the retreat rolls for that. Stand, uh, nothing too exciting. Counterattack, there are restrictions. Has to be in command. Um, you can't use artillery and cav on a counterattack unless there's also infantry there. Line positions with militia infantry or an ineffective unit of any sort cannot be given counterattack. Lots of little special things. Um, units in a line position issued counterattack do not gain any defensive benefits from the terrain. See, here's defensible terrain as opposed to rough. There is no rough in this game. Uh, units attacking across major rivers, though, will still be halved even if you're counterattacking. Uh, officers in a line position issued the counterattack order use their defensive rating rather than an offensive writing, even though they're doing something kind of offensive. Uh, the attack, diversion, is basically an attempt to try to prevent. Um, this might be a way to get yourself into an area uh, or able to leave an area by the initiated combat marker uh, without much loss. Uh, if you're in a line position and you take advance, you're closing and firing. Uh, you have to be in line of command for that to your officer. Uh, the assault, you have to command to the officer and to, back to the commander. Um, and you can't have militia with you. Okay, then everything's going to be face down on here. The attacker picks one pair and let's say the defender's only in the center and the attacker's in these two, he could pick one of these to fight the center, either one, and then the other one would still come in later. The first thing you do is you consult the combat intensity chart, and you compare the defender's command to the attacker's command. Rain might reduce that, and you get a number. Remember that number. <laughs> then... You add up all the strength points, and that's going to be the number of boxes of everything. Well, of all infantry. Cavalry. Um, well, units that cross major rivers or forced march will be halved. I don't think you're halved twice. Cavalry fighting anything other than militia. Uh will be halved, and artillery is going to be based on this chart, which combines the um, combat order with which nationality, whatever, which faction uh, you're talking about. Um, 
So artillery is usually not worth one point each. Cavalry is usually not either. Uh, there's a shift possible for terrain, but in general, what you do is you take an attacker defender ratio, you apply whatever shift there is, you compare it to the combat intensity level, and that's the amount of casualties the attacker, then the defender left right, take. Remember those. <laughs> you don't have to remember this anymore. Then, if Remember, there's restrictions. You can only fire once with any given wing. If that wing is firing against the other wing that's fighting, that the attacker chose or whatever. If basically both sides choose whether or not they're firing. In general, you will be firing, but there are cases, because you can only fire once during a combat, where you might not fire uh, if you're outnumbered, for example. And what you do here is you compare your line position's combat order to the total current strength of the line position that does not count in the combat intensity chart, uh, the, the losses from that. Remember, you're just remembering those losses. And you have some uh, impact. So uh, defenders non-artillery are tripled in mountainous terrain. They have that here too. We have no mountainous terrain in this game, I don't believe. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I'm mistaken. There is mountainous. Green tint over brown. Well, geez. That's areas 3, 10, and 18. Um, Vicksburg is 18. 3 and 10. So this bluff here is considered mountainous. And that is the only terrain in this game that is. Okay. So, yeah, Vicksburg is really nasty to attack. If any of the attacker's units cross major rivers, they'll be halved or force marched. The attacker and defender cavalry, uh, same, same rules as before, will be halved. Artillery, depend on this. You get your firepower value. Now, there are some modifiers, uh, column shift modifiers. Uh, line position from infantry units from two or more different formations gets a shift against it for the defender. And it gets a shift in favor if you have a higher ranked defending officer than the attacker's attacking officer, unless you have multiple formations. And it actually has to be the right formation. The officer counts as a unit for this. Um, the attacker loses two columns if he's got from two different formations. Uh, he loses one if def additional, okay, if additional defenders line positions are adjacent to the one being fired on that are not being fired on this round, uh, you shift one in your favor if you have the better officer attack versus defense in this case. You shift a column to the right if the line that you're firing on only contains militia. And you shift a column to the right if the line position being fired on was adjacent to another defender's line position that took a withdraw command. Okay, so two to one doesn't give you a bonus, but if there's a withdrawal going on, uh, it does give you a bonus for the adjacents because the line is collapsing in front of you. Weird? Yeah. Okay. So, that is going to give you some potential additional losses. And then those losses are marked on the loss chart. Uh, I believe the restriction there is you must take the losses on effective units first. Once all effective units have stopped being effective, you can start taking losses on ineffective units. Anything exciting here? This is all stuff I covered here. The entire line has to be counted uh, completely and applied in one place. After you do the fire combat results, then you add those number, that number you remembered to the number here and asterisks mean you have a reroll, and that's the total amount of damage you do. If the, uh, uh, 
When the attacker allocates his strength point losses among the units in his line position, he must, in addition to following the guidelines in Rule 12.91, take as many infantry strength losses as the defender chose to do. What? I gotta think about that. I don't know what's going on there, but I gotta swap batteries too. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a restriction that if the defender is taking um, losses to infantry, the attacker must take as many losses to infantry as the defender does, up to his total number of losses, which will usually be at least as high as the defender. Um, uh, which is to say, he can't take those losses on cav or artillery or whatever if the defender's chosen to take his losses on infantry. All right, leaders. Leaders are, well, there's two types of leaders in the game. Generally, there's officers and commanders. Mississippi Fortress is a little different. We'll get to that in the special rules, but um, other than command and control, uh, leaders in combat have two values, an attack value and a defense value. Um, if you have an officer in line position and your opponent does not, or you have a bonus uh, between ratings. So the attacker's rating for attack would be compared to the defender's rating for defense. And the difference between them, well, if a difference between them exists, then you get an advantage of a shift in your favor. Uh, if I understand correctly. We'll follow, you know, what the charts say as we do it. Okay. Officers can only help line positions that have regular infantry units of only their own formation. Artillery, cav, garrisons, and militia um, are fine and don't count against that as long as it's only one infantry formation, regular infantry formation, and it's the right one for that leader, uh, for that officer. Now, officers who are in a line position might get killed. That's based on the combat intensity level. If it's zero, you're fine. If it's one or two, you have, your line position has to lose four strength points during a single round of combat. Now, that's not one set of die rolls in CIC. That's a single round. Uh, i.e. you could be attacked from multiple areas, so there's a chance there. And in this case, on a roll of one, the officer is a casualty. Uh, this is weird because... Uh, so what's weird is a round of combat doesn't necessarily apply to a single combat intensity, and that's, uh, that's left ambiguous. Um, if the combat intensity is three or four, an officer casualty can happen if the line position loses three or more strength points during the round, and then it's a one or a two. So there's two ways you can read this. You can read by round, meaning one combination CIC fire from one uh, wing to another, or you can read it as across the whole line, and then I guess just take the highest of the combat intensity levels. Uh, Okay. Um, if the casualty happens, uh, it doesn't apply until the end of the ra second round of combat. When an officer casualty is inflicted, the officer counter is removed from play. Commanders normally are in the reserve position and will not be at risk. However, in Mississippi Fortress, they can be in the front lines. Uh, at the start of the next friendly combat communications phase, you must replace the leader, and there may be designated replacements or kind of uh, unnamed ones who are basically zero zeros. Okay, what about stragglers? We kind of talked about these already. It can happen during force march, and you basically roll on this table. There are some modifiers. The other time it can happen is when you withdraw. Uh, if infantry or cav is given a withdrawal order, they have to make a roll for straggling. Um, the way straggling is marked is different from casualties. You put little circles on the other end. You put little, some kind of mark to indicate death from the left. You put little circles from the right. Okay. Um, 
stragglers can be recovered. Uh, in order to recover stragglers, you can't move. You stay in an area unoccupied by real enemy infantry, cav, or artillery. And infantry will get one straggler, one straggler back per unit per turn. Cavalry get two pack per unit per turn. Um, and you just erase the circles. The cav units that are not recovering their own stragglers can help the infantry by rounding them up. If a cav unit began the movement phase in the same area as the infantry unit, uh, and it remains stationary, it can increase the rate of recovery for all the infantry units in the area to two strength points per turn. Straggler losses reduce the unit's strength point total. Actual losses, there's no rule like this. Uh, but they can also cause it to become ineffectual. Uh, if the strength point drops to zero due to straggler losses, the unit stays on the map, but it can't move until it gains some strength points back. Uh, it doesn't have control or influence in the area, it does not block, it is not involved in combat. Uh, it is sort of a ghost that can't be hurt, and it's weird. <laughs> uh, a unit may be rendered ineffective due to straggler losses and restored to effectiveness through straggler recovery. So you have to keep track of which losses are combat permanent ones and which are straggling. Okay, unit ineffectiveness is fairly simple. There's a number next to each unit. That's how many boxes it has to have to be effective. Right? The number of unmarked boxes, yeah, is less than or equal to the large number on the right. The unit becomes ineffective, yeah. So some of these units have a zero in effectiveness rating. They can never become ineffective. But most regular infantry, and probably cavalry as well, I'm not sure, eh, they got zeros on them. Um, most of the regular infantry have this. So as long as this has three uh, or more boxes that are unmarked, it's effective. No, I'm sorry. As long as it has more than three boxes, it's effective. If it ever drops down to three boxes, it becomes ineffective and it cannot gain any sorts of victory points for the player. It cannot force march. It does not block enemy lines of communications. It cannot probe or intercept. Um, it, cannot, it should not be deployed alone in a line position, if it's possible to do otherwise. If it's forced to be deployed alone, it can only select withdrawal. And line positions within effective units cannot be given an attack order, or, well, they can't attack, and they can't be given a counterattack order. Then uh, you calculate the victory points that you make during your game. Now, <laughs> victory points are part of the uh, uh, the specific roles to a game. You must not lie when collecting victory points. Um, you might have to expose something though. And here's an example of them: casualties, cost, etc. We'll worry about those more during play itself. All right. Well, that's the core of the rules for this series, which is called what? So that I remember to put it down. This is the Civil War campaign series. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I'll send this up, and then I am pretty fatigued already and not terribly looking forward to this. Like I said, I played around with the... Uh, with the real basic scenario, and I don't think this is going to work too well so long. Um, but uh, we'll give it a shot, see, see what we get out of it, and uh, we'll load this up now.